we can choose to respond in a way that's way more positive, right? We're adults. We're trained grownups who've been practicing how to act for a long time. Like, and so what we should be able to do is both talk to each other in a way that's, you know, respectful. And I think more importantly, honestly, positive. Welcome to the Bro Novo podcast, the podcast that models healthy communication for men, empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Welcome everybody. This week I have an awesome conversation with Lee B. Lee B is an old friend of mine. He works professionally in the public policy arena and we cover a lot of ground in this episode. He's a very smart guy with a lot of interesting ideas, and I know you will enjoy the episode. And we're live. Lee B, good evening, my friend. How are you? Hey, Tom. How are you, man? This is, uh, this is great to be on with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked, dude. You are uh, truly one of the most interesting people I know. And as a good friend of yours, it's fun to have you on because usually I have to ask people about their introductions and, and all that. But I, I could just introduce you. Things I know about you, Lee, you have lived in New Orleans. You were there during Katrina, which is absolutely wild. You've lived in Houston. You've lived over in the Netherlands, in yeah. the Hague. And you presently reside in the Washington, D.C. DC area. So that's quite a spread, man, of places to live. And I, Well, so I lived in Washington, D.C. and Arlington. Right. Yeah, you know, that's an important, important, important difference to the people of D.C. Supposedly there's some beef there. I don't even <laughs> know about it, but supposedly there are some issues there. You don't want to cross the river. For some reason, I guess to frame it, you know, when we met, you were, I would say like a Southern guy, you know, largely you, you had had that international exposure, but I mean, you were fresh from playing high school rugby and football in Houston, and then you find yourself up in DC. So how was that experience for you as far as new place, new part of the country, different types of people? Honestly, man, I was prepared for it moving from Houston to DC because I had already done a big move before when I moved from New Orleans to the Netherlands. Like, you know, that was a crazy, and then I moved from the Netherlands to Houston. Um, so it was kind of easy, man. Like, honestly, like, I think I was definitely angry that I moved like the first two times. And like, cause you know, how old was I? I was 11 and then 15. And like, I think both times I felt like I had things going and then it's like you end up in a different place. Once you've transitioned in that way, in which it's kind of forced and uh, not perfect, you know, transitioning to college, which is something like you completely control, you know, you've picked this, you know, you're doing your thing. Like, it was awesome, man. Like, so I think that, you know, I was kind of ready to, to move, I guess, or whatever. I was prepared, at least. I mean, you know, I definitely I'm still close with all my friends from Houston. Um, but, you know, I was prepared to move to go on to college. And, you know, I really think that has to do with kind of doing it before. And, you know, I think that just really is about like practice, man. Things, things get better as you kind of do them over and over. You know, I'm a big emphasis of repetition. I've been trying to repeat a lot of good habits recently. You know, it's definitely about failure and just repeating, man. And so when I moved to D.C., I think the craziest thing that for me that was there was just like I had never encountered the type of people that are from the Northeast before. You know, it's a very different culture. You know, you can never be prepared for that. Like, I questioned a lot of things. There are a lot of things that were strange. But it's like, I did the same thing when I moved from the Netherlands to Houston. Sudden, like, you know, the stuff that you're rocking that was cool is not cool. And same thing happened when I moved from uh, Houston to D.C. You know, I had to get a yeah. whole new wardrobe to fit in. It's, it's costly. Dude, I know. I mean, in that school, you know, we were at private school, basically. That's what it was. and. I've had conversations yeah, with, with my friends on here about like just that culture, that like Northeast, there's layers to it. Like the Northeast, it has that kind of agro direct communication style, but also that environment we were in was a, a bubble, you know? Yeah. And it was, I, I found it very ironic because despite being in this international place with all these opportunities to connect with people from all over the world, most people it seemed were just not leaving the eight by eight campus even though we were down the street from these major international organizations. Yeah, I definitely think that's there. Like, you know, people kind of stick to like what's comfortable and, you know, that works out some of the times, you know what I mean? Like if you're in like an elite group, 
then you like go from elite high schools to an elite college and whatever, then go to an elite work field. Like that works pretty well. But it also shows you how like people get siphoned into like certain ways that aren't so good. You know what I mean? Where if you're kind of sticking to like the known groups, then these outcomes don't work out as well. And, uh, you know, so I think people do that because it's comfortable, man. And uh, I mean, it's definitely like I never talked to like, for example, any of the international students that went and like were speaking a different language. Like I never made an attempt to hang out with any of those people. I actually did have a friend who he was with this like Korean group and they like threw some parties. My man, Carl, shout out Carl. But, you know, that's what was cool about Carl, man, is he broke out of his box. He hung out with different people. Um, and I, dude, I think that's important because it creates like new opportunities. Kind of if you're willing to like, you know, stretch yourself and make an effort to like show people that you care, you're interested mm-hmm. in stuff like that, which people are definitely afraid to do, especially if they're like different than you. Right. Because you already have that barrier. And then it's like, I'm going to put myself out there for this person. You know, that kind of risk, like people are afraid to do it. And it's definitely, it's probably something I didn't do, like, you know, talking about, like, the experience of these moves. It's probably something I didn't do, like, earlier in my life, but it's definitely something I tried to do when I went to GW. Like, I tried a lot of different job internships. You know, I think I interned, like, almost every semester I was there. Because, you know, I was curious about, like, pushing myself. And, like, at those things, I wanted, like, diverse experiences with diverse kind of skill sets. You know, so that, that's kind of something I was looking for because because I kind of realized the value. Like there are all these like this is what I learned from living in the Netherlands. There's all these cool people out there who just like have like, come from completely different worlds. Like, you know, people from the, uh, the the Gulf countries in Arabia, you know, people from Asia, people from Africa. I mean, even Europe that I was never exposed to living in New Orleans and just kind of interacting with those people and learning the value, like the cool things about like how they grew up and like what they were into and stuff like that. And, you know, kind of learning tidbits of the language, like, you know, a couple of phrases here and there, like you know, <laughs> that's so like cool. And like, I think if you're able to do that, if you're able to like, you know, I think, you know, this was like my privilege or whatever growing up in that environment is like, you learn, like you have to make connections with people different from you. It's a lot easier going forward. Right. It's like a learning experience. Like you're interacting with people who like people who would be like, fuck the USA, like, you know, just completely like, you know, in the US, you're told a certain set of beliefs in their country, right? A a whole different set of beliefs about Mm -hmm. politics or whatever. And you'd have to hear this. And like, you know, coming from the US where, you know, like people in the US are like, we're the top dog or whatever, you know, growing up, that's what I kind of like learned as a kid. Um, It's just kind of weird. It's like, wait, what? Like they're they're saying bad things about the US. Like I can't do anything about that. So, I, you know, it's interesting, man. And it definitely made me like more tolerant, more accepting, more understanding and uh, more willing to kind of like reach out to people who are different or like in an environment where, um, you know, you're the different person. Right. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that I feel like a lot of people like don't necessarily experience where they're the fish out of water. And it's like, you know, I, I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. I mean, you know, maybe for good reason, you know, in some cases, but like. You know, people are afraid to like step out of their box because like there's so much risk associated with it. But like if you're willing to do that, I think there's a lot that can pay off. And like something that I've always like prided in myself and maybe I'm like a little impulsive, um, but I've always like prided in myself kind of like a willingness to like put myself out there with someone. You know, like uh, that that's something that I definitely think is important. And like I wish more people would do because like a lot of situations that don't go well. Like, I think if people were, like, just willing to, like, you know, like, maybe embarrass themselves, like, a little bit, like, a small chance, but by putting themselves out there, like, a lot of these situations would go a lot better. But, you know, that's how it is. Absolutely, man. It's a, it's a fine line between meeting new people, having new experiences, and overcoming that fear of rejection, or maybe it's exposure, or just making, making myself feel foolish, you know? Mm -hmm. But... I, I I agree, man. I think we're aligned in that in as far as a core value being breaking out of the box and the comfort zone. And to me, it's been incredibly rewarding because then you just, worst thing that happens is the person doesn't want to talk to you yeah. and your friends make your, in my case, my mean friends from Philly make fun of me for being a weirdo, you know, like that. I mean, we made fun of you in college for it. Like you, yeah, everyone you definitely does, put you know? yourself out there, man. You're, you're a pro at that. <laughs> I think you I know. you were good friends with a couple of homeless people. Like I yeah. cut them off. I was like, fuck that man. Like well, it wasn't a good, I mean, it yeah. wasn't a healthy relationship. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I, I, I know. I remember who you're referring to. <laughs> yeah. 
Awesome, no, that man, guy but... found me a couple <laughs> years later and like his foot was cut off and his arm was cut off because he had <laughs> diabetes. And like at the end of the day, like, you know, he should have been making, I don't, I don't want to say he couldn't have made healthier decisions, but like, you know, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think, I think there were better decisions he could have been making, you know, that would have prevented that. I don't that know. could have prevented the homeless guy from getting diabetes, Lee. Well, no, he had diabetes, but managing that illness, like you know, right? There's a well, certain level of responsibility. I mean, some of those guys, all I these, heard, all these rich Americans in houses yeah. have diabetes. You kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but like, I think there's like, I've I've offered like food to like a lot of homeless people, and like they're usually like the ones who are like chill will usually like tell me either, hey, I have food already. Or like, you know, yeah. something like that. And so I just feel like the food is available. Maybe it's not healthy food. And, you know, that would excel, you know, that would have accelerated the condition. You know, I really shouldn't have uh, put myself out like the like that. Now I'm going to get canceled, right, for saying yeah, that a homeless man could have prevented his diabetes from progressing. But, Kiss you goodbye. <laughs> yeah, this is the end. No, no. It's good. It's good. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff there. But circling back around to some of those yeah. – positive habits that you've been reinforcing mm-hmm. what are the, what are those so i think the big one right now is so i've been living with my girlfriend now i think i think at least four years and so i think one of the things that we were messing up on is like the tone in which we talked with each other and so one of the kind of the cues i've been trying to work on is like the tone because i think it's very easy to fall out of that habit when you've been with someone for like a long time. And it's easy when like situations are stressful or less than ideal, which, you know, happens all the time. That kind of stuff, you know, is just very easy to build up and it just builds up anxiety, aggression, and like, you know, eventually I guess resentment, which is, you know, pretty bad. And so I think tone is like something that I've been kind of, you know, trying to focus on a lot. That's actually funny enough. So I have two dogs now. Luke and Dean, uh, both lab mixes. And, and so one of the things that we're working on with the dogs is the tone, the different ways in which we talk to them to reinforce habits. And I think that's like tone is such a good example of like a very small thing. You have an entire like conscious control over that you can do to like improve a relationship. You know, if it's with your, you know, uh, your partner, you know, with people at work, you know, people on the street or whatever, um, you know, it's definitely like the tone in which you say something, it, you know, changes so much of the message. So that's like a little habit that I'm focusing on. And I think in the past when I focused on like things, I would try to focus on improving like too many things at once. So like tone and healthy eating decisions are like my two things right now. I'm trying to get skinny. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get thin. So I've been trying to make healthy eating really? decisions. Yeah. I mean, thin is, thin is, thin is a body type, man. Well, thin is, you know, there's only, I think there's only so thin. What does that I mean? Get. What does that mean to you? I think right, I have we'll, a, we'll, hold on. Let's, we'll get to body image next. Okay. Circle back around to tone here. I yeah. like that. Can you give us an example of one thing with your partner and one thing with a, a pet and, and, you know, how, to paint, paint the portrait for the people. Hmm. Okay. So I think, you know, tone, one of the more stressful things in our lives right now are our two dogs, Luke and Dean. You know, I, I was like, you know, do they cause me more stress to have them or less stress to have them? Just because they both have, you know, sets of behavioral issues that they've kind of, um, that we've inherited because they're both rescue dogs. So they're both kind of triggered by strollers, um, loud noises, scooters, that kind of stuff. And then Luke has a whole set of nemeses. So he has about like, you know, 10 to 15 dogs, <laughs> 10 to 15 dogs that due to past issues, if he sees them, it's on site. He woke up and chose violence. You know, he, he goes crazy mm-hmm. and it's, it's bad because then Dean gets set off. And so, right, we're just increasing the stress, right? Luke gets stressed and then Dean gets stressed. Right. And so I think this is just kind of a perfect example, too, for people where kind of on these walks, like I would, you know, get annoyed at Sam, you know, my partner, because she would not respond in a way that I thought was like correct for the situation or not whatever. Mm -hmm. And like think or I would basically get frustrated with the dogs. And then that would rise the tension level in her because the way I'm saying things now, right, is just raising the tension level. And so I think it's just kind of like a spiral. 
where, you know, everyone just gets tense with each other, right? People talk about tense rooms, right? It's, you know, people can vibe off certain energies, right? There are certain emotions that I think are kind of like universal that people understand. And like, you know, so in this case, you know, the tone of the situation was set as negative and, and, you know, the dogs can't control it, you know, that much. Like we can train it in them, but you know what I mean? They don't have, they can't make a conscious decision every time sure. necessarily, or at least I'm not going to account for them that way. Um, but, you know, Sam and I in this situation, when the dogs are tense, we can choose to respond in a way that's way more positive, right? We're adults. We're trained grownups who've been practicing how to act for a long <laughs> yeah. time. Like, and so what we should be able to do is both talk to each other in a way that's, you know, respectful. And I think more importantly, honestly, positive, you know, making sure to use a positive tone, the way in which you say it and the words that you say, of course, but most importantly, I think the way in which you say it to relieve the situation. And that's just like, I think you have to be genuine in that. And that like, that's, it's kind of a fake it till you make it situation. Where I think when you improve the tone on your things, you're reinforcing a behavior in yourself, you know, that's positive and is going to look at things like in a positive situation. Because I, I think, you know, like from, you know, things that have happened in my life in the past couple of years, like definitely the tone that I've used, I think has been more negative. And it's really a question of like constant reinforcement and finding these small habits that are reinforcing behaviors because honestly man i don't think people are that much different from dogs like you know we can talk we can play on computers we can do a bunch (laughs) of fancy stuff you know like fly planes but at the end of the day like behaviorally you know i think we're pretty similar and so um you know i just think it's really interesting the way in which like you know our dogs get more tense when we're tense we get more tense when our dogs are tense and it's really about figuring out ways you know, as kind of the adult, as the actor with free will to relieve the tension in that situation. And I think that's so important. For sure. So the example would be like dogs are misbehaving. It's stressful for you and the other person. And Sam doesn't do something that you think is the right response. And then you kind of take out your, your, your frustration of the whole situation on her which you've then identified is not really productive because nothing's really going to change the dogs in that moment, most likely. And it's certainly not going to be something she says in that moment. Right. So at that point, it's just like your frustration at the situation is being taken out on her Mm -hmm. as opposed to saying something more constructive or just saying, this is really annoying me right now. And yeah, let's just, let's just get out of here so we can all calm down. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a great option to calming down because that's all you can do in some situations, right? Like when our dogs are acting crazy, that's all you can really do to control them in that moment. You know, you can mm-hmm. reinforce positive behaviors before that, but the positive behavior in that moment is let's chill out. Because you don't need to be happy to see that dog, but you need to at least be chilled out. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's a ph- philosophical st- school called stoicism. Where essentially, you know, people have the free will, people have the ability to govern their actions. And so like there's an initial reaction you can have, you know, you can be mad for a second, but you need to overcome that and take a step back, assess the situation and essentially calm yourself so that you make a rational decision. And that's, I guess, you know, that's kind of the root of what I've been working on when I'm working on the tone of my situation. You know, I think another example where I've been working on tone is people in the traffic interface so both pedestrians and cars so like you know having biked in the city one of the things that i learned you need to not be afraid of is to yell at cars especially cabbies because cabbies will have their windows down a little bit so you you know you want to talk to them to communicate Mm -hmm. where you're going because some of the streets in dc swerve and so there are a lot of stressful situations where people could basically due to you know being in this high tension situation, make a mistake and hit you, right? I'm not going to say it's their fault because they're being careless, but if they're trying to make this move so they can get a place, you know, quickly and you're, could be in the way, right? They don't think you're a risk when you are. So they're making a poor decision kind of as a result of the tension of the situation. And so one of the things that I thought was important was kind of communicating to them beforehand, you know, just saying like, Hey, like, you know, real positively, I would try to be positive. But I think the problem came in when people did not listen and continue to do things. My tone, the way that I addressed the situation was extremely negative, you know, and I think that, you know, in, in some cases, maybe it's justified, right? Because they're about to run you over with their car 
and you know you have your your bike lock in your hand and you're trying to figure out a way to push off or something to protect yourself um but you know that's it's it's a situation where maybe kind of a tenser tone is justified kind of just like with the dogs like maybe sometimes you need to take a really tough tone to get their attention i think that's a great point just around like taking control of thoughts and making an intentional move to improve our lives from it because I don't know, man, I think it, myself personally, a lot of people, you know, bro nouveau show, you know, the men, like, I feel like men are pretty like oftentimes at, at the will of our emotions and kind of getting thrown around that way. Um, as opposed to being in control. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. Yeah. And I always thought that was so funny that, you know, men will call women like too emotional and stuff like that. But I think oftentimes, you know, men, men are very emotional, very emotionally driven. And so I've always found that to be funny. And, uh, you know, I, I think I might be that way, but I, you know, I try and, I try and think logically about a situation and, you know, act positively if I can. Okay. So talk to me about this, your fitness goals. And, you know, you said you wanted to thin out. I think that's interesting. You know, we're, we're both big dudes. And I think that there's a lot of a lot more understanding in the culture around the kind of pressure that women face as far as to be look a certain way to, to be incredibly skinny, but also still, you know, have a big butt and boobs in that it's like, that's not really possible. Um, <laughs> but I don't think there's a lot of chat <laughs> around, around men and like how men talk about and think about our bodies. So yeah, talk to me about what you, you mentioned a little bit about you're trying to, you're trying to thin out. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me, you know, I think it's principally a health decision. You know, I, there are definitely ways to, to make yourself, you know, focus to have certain features, you know, you can always enhance your features, I think through, through exercise. Um, if you really do focus on something, um, you know, my, my butt is large and I squat a lot of weight. Um, right. Those things are, <laughs> are correlated, you know, and some people, I guess are just, uh, you know, blessed with, you know, larger butts and smaller butts. Um, from what I understand, <laughs> my butt is rather large for my size. So, um, you know, I guess I'm somewhere on the Kardashian scale. I'm not that jiggly, though. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, for me, it's really just a health decision. And, and I think, you know, as long as people are healthy and happy with the, what they're doing, that's what's important. You know, I think that people have to realize, you know, certain limitations of their situation, right? You're, you're going to, you can work on something and you can develop that, but it's going to take years. And then more importantly, you know, there's only limits that your body can do. And that's something that I've definitely had to face recently a lot is kind of the limits of my situation. Like, I think I learned from playing with guys who, who did play at the pro level, the limits of my career as a rugby player. Um, you know, mm -hmm. previously I kind of learned my limits as a musician. Um, so I, I think, you know, kind of those accepting the reality, understanding where you relate, you know, to the world, it's, it's, a, it's, it's tough to, it's, it's tough to realize. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been tough for me to kind of accept my place in the rugby hierarchy. Like, you know, this is exactly where you exist. I'm retired now, but I retired knowing how I stack. Like I feel comfortable rating myself relative to mm -hmm. a, a large number of players, you know, kind of like my own little hall of fame or whatever. But I think that's why so many people have body image issues is they have trouble accepting that, you know what, no matter how, how hard you work, there's a limit to this, right? You know, you know, it's just not meant to be. And, and that's a tough thing for people to accept, right? Because, you know, you want it all. You see people out there who, ha who have it all, right? In quotations, they right, have everything. Right, right. But, you know, they want something else. You know, a lot of the times, I mean, maybe some of those people are happy. And then the simple fact that a lot of people need to realize is a lot of these guys and gals are on good old steroids. They're on, I don't know if they're on HGH. I don't know if they're on, like, I don't know any of the other ones, like Trend and shit like that. But, like, they're on <laughs> shit like that. They're on tons of supplements. Like, and you know what? If you want to look just like that Instagram model, you know, you, maybe hard work, some plastic surgery, and a little bit of steroids, you can do it. So it's kind of about being willing to go to the lengths <laughs> to get these things. And, and that's something people got to realize is like, what to what lengths are you going to go to to get this? You know, how hard are you going to push for this thing for how much success? 
you know, it, mm-hmm. it, you know, at the end of the day, some things just are not meant to be and people need to accept that and, and embrace what they have. And, and you know, that's, what's really, that's what makes you special, right? You're not going to be special being anyone else. Um, and, and so mm-hmm. for me, you know, what success looks like kind of with my fitness and, and the goals I want to get to um, is to kind of just continue doing things that I like and, and seeing how that takes my body. You know, I, I think that my weight, I don't think I can get like below 200. Like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 5'11", which I read about is the most lied about height, not six foot. It's 5'11". I totally, I totally buy that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm 5'10 and three quarters. Oh, so are you 5'11"? Are you 5'11"? 5'10 five, and three quarters. <laughs> Close a fucking enough. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> hey, everyone wants oh, to be taller. My, my oh, high school totally, profile dude. said six foot. Oh my god, that's a joke. I didn't even want that. <laughs> I wanted that. See, oh, peer pressure, hilarious. peer pressure influencing your concept of your body image. I know. Yeah. But uh right now, you know For sure. I'm retired from contact rugby. I I don't think I can play anymore. I think that I got one tired of getting hit in the face and then I had just some like nagging chronic chronic injuries from from really from tight muscles and stuff like that in a couple places. So right now, you know, with the things I'm doing are swimming, playing touch rugby, which I really enjoy. You know, I get a thrill from playing touch rugby, uh, basketball. Um, and then, you know, just I, I haven't been to a gym in over a year, but I got like three kettlebells, you know, for a total of less than $250. And like those, are, that's my gym. I have those and some resistance bands and you can do everything with that. Um, so so that's kind of like what I've been doing for, for fitness, that and counting calories. And I just want to see where that takes me. And, um, you know, if it gets to a point where I have to, you know, just eat less and less calories, you know, to get to a weight, then I'm going to stop doing that. You know, I think, you know, I think my body will let me know when, when what I have is healthy because, uh, you know, that's kind of the name of the game. You know, if you're going for anything else, you're crazy, you know? Yeah, man, dude, well said. And thanks for being so open on that. I think that you're doing some great modeling there for a lot of men who, I've thought about their bodies and what they want from their body and how, what they want to look like. But I think what you're kind of proposing is one evaluating the influence. So what is driving someone to, to want to make these changes? Is it a productive mm-hmm. driver? Is it, is it a healthy motivation or is it something that's a little more toxic and unattainable? And, and two, just being realistic on it and saying, you know what, this is the body I've been given and I may never, you know, get to this incredible image that society has given us, but rather why don't I just be realistic with my goals and try to get healthy? Yeah. And I, yeah, I can totally relate to that, man. I mean, it's the, I don't know. I think this is the environment that we put ourselves in. The rugby environment is so like, it's so big, strong, fast, Mm -hmm. hit hard, you know, all that, which is great, but it's also like, you know, I'm, I'm at a bit of a crossroads, like, you know, as, as we've seen the, the soldiers are falling down a little bit as far as who's still, who's still playing and I'm still going at this point, but it's, I've thought a lot about trying to play up, you know, and mm-hmm. trying to go, I'm living in the Bay area. There's so much good rugby. Yeah. You can go play also, D1. I, what I'm, yeah, I can go try to play D1. I mean, yeah. dude, that's like a full-time job. Yeah. That's doing that, why but, I stopped. <laughs> yeah. I, was competing, I wasn't was even D1. Like, I was competing to be D1. I was like D1, like a couple yeah. matches. But I was trying because it's a full time job. A bunch of those guys want to play pro. I was like, okay, yeah, I back up the guys who want to, you know, try it out, and we're like the backups for the pro team. Like, not even the the pro team; they're the backups for the pro team, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. So I, that's good, man. I think I think a lot of people will come to those crossroads in their lives around, you know, what is sustainable, what habits, you know, bring me joy and are sustainable, and which ones are actually you know, not going to be that sustainable. And I also think it's a good point around being realistic and about fitness goals, because I don't know how this happened, but it seems like in our country, it's like fit. It's like a binge, like everything else. It's like go to the gym for three weeks, burn out and then never work out again for six months. And then until I'm disgusted with myself and then start over, yeah. you know, and that's like, yeah, people want- why is that? Why is that the approach? Yeah. You know, instead of something more sustainable. Yeah. People want a quick fix solution right? To everything, you know, that's what we're sold is what success is, right? They're an overnight celebrity, 
you know, that's just so much of the culture, I think, in the U.S. I don't know about the rest of the world. I, I couldn't tell you accurately. Um, but I could guess that, you know, they have similar stuff going on there. And it's just so it's it's kind of a lie that people are told to keep them, you know, I think doing things that are unsuccessful. Like, I don't think anyone's doing it consciously or there's like a group or anything like that. But it's just kind of a good strategy maybe to sell things, right? You want to sell that lifestyle because that's what people want. People want the lifestyle of the fitness guru who goes on, you know, Instagram and is squatting, you know, two attractive women you know, and stuff like that. Um, oh, that or, guy's or, ridiculous. You know what I'm talking about? That's, Bradley that's Martin. That's that what I was thinking of. Absolutely absurd. <laughs> yeah, and that dude's, I'm pretty sure that dude's roided out. Like, you know, like no yeah, offense to him. Like he, he has what he wants. Like, I think that's like, if he's doing it healthily, like, it, you know, I don't know all the upsides, downsides of that stuff. He, I think, you know, if he wants to do that, sure. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to look like Bradley Martin then, you know, at the end of the day. You know, it doesn't matter what I do. I won't look like that then. Um, you know. Yeah, he's only 5'10", dude. He's not 5'11", Bradley. <laughs> probably. He probably is probably <laughs> truthful about his height. That's probably why he's so swole. He's truthful about his height. Awesome, man. Okay, so I want to pivot a little bit towards just one thing. So I think you are a pretty internationally minded guy. You know, you keep up with. World Affairs, I think you're pretty tapped into things outside of the U.S. A lot of Americans are not. And maybe a lot of people who listen to this have never taken the time to explore what happens beyond these these shores. Mm -hmm. So give us an elevator pitch for why somebody should care about international affairs, international happenings. I think I could answer that question in one word. COVID-19. This is something, you know, this has been a trend that's kind of happened in Asia like a number of times, you know, with plant and animal viruses jumping to people, right? You know, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the prevailing theory about it. I think that's how this group of illnesses started in Asia. I don't want to get into the whole lab leak right. and stuff like that. Like, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> honestly, I'd love to know the answer, but, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know how much it matters right now. But, uh, you know, it, there's been a massive problem in society where kind of these, you know, animal diseases are getting passed to humans because there's an increasing amount of interactions with people in those animals. We're eating exotic salamanders from in these cave systems where all kinds of viruses, you know, interact. But what, what I want to sell you on is why should, people should care about science why people should care about the world beyond them and why people should care about problem solving and understanding what's going on most importantly. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on out there yeah. and we have access to the internet, which is amazing. So, yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, just go yeah. on the BBC. The BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation. You'll immediately just get stuff from the UK. Right. And so if you're kind of wanting to enter into the waters, They'll have American stories. You can read what the British think about what's going on in America. And they have tons. Like, it's not like they're reporting this from the UK. Like they have offices all and reporters all over the US, right? These are real reporters. It's just for a British audience. And I think that's a quick and easy way to kind of see what do other people think of the United States, you know, in, like an entry into that world. And then also, um, you know, what do, do the British think about the world? Because the international section on there is really easy to read about. You can go read about Britain. You can go read about what's going on in, in the world. I think the British like to read about their former colonial possessions. So there will be mm -hmm. like a slight bias there towards like the news in like India, South Africa, Egypt, Australia. Australia. You know, so they're a little biased there. I think I picked up on that. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's just a great source, a great way to learn, you know, what do these people, um, you know, who honestly American culture, right, is kind of descended from, you know, we, we were started out as British colonies, right? Um, so I think there's kind of some ties there. And so this is an easy way to uh, can start to connect with the world. And from there, you know, there's, there's news agencies in every country. Um, and then your favorite U.S. news channel usually has reporters um, in every country, but usually those stories are a little harder to find. The BBC has found has made it very open. They also have a lot of good science articles. You know, you can kind of read, they have a great series on human history and understanding. Here I am being a salesman for the BBC, but it's really great. Like if you want to, <laughs> I think, I think it's important, like, you know, to start to learn, like, you know, you need, you need some good entry points and I, you know, I'd recommend that source. 
Um, and, and from there, just start to kind of Google the things that, that you read about. You know, there's a whole article on like basically, you know, that I've gotten into recently, like basically why humans are the way they are. And so it's like paleolithic finds from around the world. And it's like talking about like human evolution and like how this connects with like human behaviors today. And I just find that so fascinating because I think like, like I was saying earlier at the end of the day, like we're pretty simple behaviorally. Like, you know, we do all these fancy things. We talk about this fancy mm -hmm. stuff. We can use computer and whatnot, go to the space, but like behaviorally, you know, we have very similar drivers as other animals, right? You know, we know, we know death's coming for us. We know I have a limited amount of time to do this stuff. Um, and we either can like, you know, embrace that or we can, you know, run away from that. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I think it's really important, you know, for us to kind of remember where we came from, you know, and, and I think, you know, one of the best ways to do that is through anthropology, which is kind of the study of like human and, and chimpanzees and like our class of creatures, I believe. Um, and so I think that's like a really good way to do it. Um, and, and. You know, be, I, I recommend if you can find any good sources like that, um, you know, PBS is fantastic. I, you know, I watched PBS as a kid. One of the things I never I didn't have cable until I moved to the Netherlands. Um, so until I was like 11, I watched PBS all the time. You know, you learn all kinds of stuff on that and they do a great job explaining it. So definitely finding entry points into understanding not just the international, but the world, you know, is super important. And, uh, you know, it, you know, a lot of people don't like PBS because it's the public broadcasting uh, service but you know pbs is awesome man they made arthur sesame street <laughs> trying to think what else they had a bunch of kids shows pbs is all time all right awesome yeah. okay so then pivoting again staying in the political realm a little more domestic here mm -hmm. you know you're a white guy i'm a white guy yeah how have you interacted with the racial reckoning that's been happening you know where have you kind of found yourself comfortable talking what are things you haven't felt comfortable talking about and this isn't something that is brought up a lot too but like there are critiques out there of how the conversation is going right and you know a lot of people have been alienated a lot of people feel like the movement went about things the wrong way some people think they did it just right it's kind of interesting but i think as two white guys too it's important for us just to to, to chop it up there for a minute yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that's kind of important for me to remember, and, and maybe this is something I need to do a better job in my personal life too, is um, it's not my movement, if that makes sense. And I want to be, I need to clarify that statement. What I mean is mm -hmm. uh, there's not a role for me as a leader to make, I think, statements about how things should be, you know, what the problems are, because I'm not the one who is facing these issues, right? You know, I'm not, I'm as a white male, right? I'm not dealing with a lot of these issues that, you know, women face and that people of color face, you know, uh, and, and I think immigrants too in the United States, um, you know, with the stigmas, uh, with, you know, kind of the negative dog whistling, all that kinds of stuff. I don't face those problems. So what's really important for me to understand is to, to step back, not be the one saying things, not be the one kind of judging how things should be, what a good solution looks like, but instead to support what I think are good solutions, right? It's not time for me to speak, but I can still reinforce what I think are the ideal solutions by, you know, donating money to the cause, um, you know, I guess marching in the, the, uh, the protests, um, which I did not do. Um, and then, uh, you know, just similar actions like that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's as simple as liking them on Facebook, right. You know, that's, that is a metric that people use for success. Um, so anything you can do to kind of ally, I guess, and support what you think, uh, is the ideal outcome. Cause right. Cause there's lots of different, I think, um, ideology, ideologies, opinions about what kind of a equal society looks like you know, Tom, that's kind of our role, right? Is, you know, I'm not sure what else we can do because I think, you know, if you kind of tried to lead a talk about the issues, you know, it's, it's I don't think it's your place. I don't think it's either of our place. Um, so I'd be interested. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've definitely had similar sentiments. And I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you on the fact that it's, you know, the people who are adversely affected, are the leaders, right? But I actually voiced that similar sentiment with 
some stuff I was doing for my high school with the prep and the diversity inclusion director, who's the leader, who's like, he was hired as the DNI director for the high school. I was on this panel of alumni and shared a similar sentiment. And then he kind of checked me and said, Tom, like the reason you're here is because I would, we need you to talk. He's like, the reason this happens or has nothing has changed is because white people are afraid to talk. Mm. So he's like, I literally brought you here to talk about this and you were going to talk about this. <laughs> huh. So I think that it was an interesting, really interesting well, yeah. perspective, you know, around saying like, you know, the whole like silence is violence thing is still true. Mm. So, and I think like if we lead a conversation among our peer group, among our families, you know, I don't think that's overstepping. Oh no, I think you know, that's, I do. That's think, what you do yeah. as an ally. I think that's. I think yeah. you know that's a situation you were invited to talk, right? I'm assuming mm. that your the the preps diversity and inclusion panel probably skewed white. Am I wrong or right? Um, wrong. I mean, oh, okay. It was a, it was a panel of of parents and alumni of color. Okay, alumni of color and, and current parents, and uh-huh. a few white people too so including me okay interesting and i think yeah it was yeah it was interesting man and what i tried to provide was just that perspective of this is what i experienced and then looking back you know these may be some of the the forces behind it and why it happened this way Mm -hmm. for me as opposed to you know like the the classic one was like the hair right like you know i thought i was so cool with my long hair you know we weren't supposed to have hair to touch it touched our collars or that area uh-huh. And I never got in trouble with it, but how come when a, a guy with braids had his hair and I braids see, yeah. and touched his collars, he got he got you know fine, he got slapped on the wrist for that, you know that those mm-hmm. little things that I was able to point out or, or we were able to point out. So yeah, I agree, man. I, I definitely think that the SJW that can be too much, but I also think that doing nothing is just as bad. Yeah, personally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely who are you to think? Who are you to say what another person or group of people want? You know, I think it's important to remember mm. that for people. You know, it, what you know, your job is to listen. And I think in like that situation you brought up, you know, what's important to note is that you were, you know, kind of um, invited to share your experience. You know, to to focus on a problem that you know it sounded like people of color were spearheading, right? In that position, I think you were an ally, right? You weren't trying to lead. You weren't trying to. Uh, you know, I, I think that's important to note that that difference. And that's really interesting, man, because I think I probably saw different things where I had people of color classmates who probably got treated differently than I did, you know, in school. And so, you know, I guess what what should, you know, people do in situations where they see people, you know, being treated unfairly, you know, and, and I mean, and how are you supposed to react in that situa- situation where it could have been like, well, you know, Tom's hair, you know, but this, this and that. And then the person with braids hair, like this, this, and that, like, you know, with the context, I guess what you're saying is how should you act in a situation where you don't understand the context, but you think someone's being treated unfairly? Cause that's, not, that's really interesting. You know, that's, that's for sure. It's probably difficult. It, it pulls to back recognize. to what we talked about originally. Oh, sorry. What'd you say? Oh, I said, it's probably just difficult to recognize. Like, you know, cause when you're doing things in the moment, you know, it's probably just tough to like think like, oh, like Tom got treated better and then this person got treated worse. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it is complicated too because then a lot of white people use that as an excuse of like, oh, they're pulling the race card, which is BS. Therefore, I'm not going to engage with it. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's kind of like a, I don't know what I'm learning as I think about this stuff, man, is that people who don't want to go there, like white people who don't want to engage, you know, I don't want to say people can't change and people are stuck in a mindset, but I don't know. I think it takes a certain amount of openness and humility perhaps to engage with it. But Mm. you know why I asked the question and, and why I bring it up is just that there are a lot of people saying these things. There are a lot of people who over the generations have said, something isn't right. Something's wrong here and it needs to change. And that's why I'm trying to just to lend my voice to it and, and hopefully promote some conversations and a largely what, I mean, I have, I don't know the demographic data of my show, but right now I'd imagine it's pretty white because I'm white and that's who I, you know, associated with largely until I became an adult and was able to make my own circles, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for sharing. And again, all this stuff we're talking about is just modeling healthy communication. That's the whole point, right? Like neither mm-hmm. Lee or I are experts on this stuff, but we care and we're trying to show the other fellows out there that we can talk about serious things and, and it could be okay. We don't combust into flames. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's definitely important. Like, you know, maybe you do combust into flames the first couple of times, you know, right. I mean, it's okay. That's fine. Like <laughs> if you've never done something before, you're going to suck at it. Like that applies to anything. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. there's, you know, I'll listen to my first couple of podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I'm probably bad right now. I'm probably a terrible podcast guest. I probably have some good yeah, highlights though. It. I bet I have some highlights. Yeah, for sure. I'm a peaks and awesome, valleys. Awesome, man. Guy. Peaks and valleys. So, okay. All right. We're going to have two more segments. I would be chagrined to let you go as someone who studied a lot of philosophy without asking you, you know, what have you learned from studying philosophy, man? I think that's really interesting. And that's an area that not a lot of people have, have jumped into. So if you could give a, a brief you know, th- thoughts on what have you learned about human nature after, after that, that study? Yeah. So I don't think that I've learned necessarily a ton about human nature from philosophy. I think that people who who say, Oh, I understand human nature because I understand the world through this philosopher's context and through their idea, uh, through their basically way of thinking right? That's, that's just completely removing your autonomy from the situation. And so I think what you learn from philosophers, or at least I think good students do, is ways to construct methods to think about the world um, based from on their own experience. Um, you know, and then, then when you do it that way, you're not deriving it from a philosopher in itself, but then you develop qualities that are maybe more similar or less similar to certain philosophers. So I think that there's a key distinction there, right? Which is, are you mm-hmm. derived from the philosopher or are derived from your experience? And I think, you know, what's key for people is to be derived from their experience, um, you know, which is definitely tough to say because what ex- what is your experience? You know, maybe it's the philosophers you read. Maybe that sets everything up. Um, you know, it's causality is so crazy how it works. Uh, you know, what, what is the cause of something in itself, right? What, what is the real cause of this action? Why did you decide to do this? Um, you know, people are so complex. And so I think that's kind of my biggest takeaway from philosophy is learning how to apply to problems, learning how to apply, uh, you know, ways of thinking to problems. I think the philosopher that really, you know, changed my way of thinking, uh, because I learned kind of a, a new way of constructing morality, um, was Hannah Arendt. Um, so her book was about the banality of evil. And, you know, that really made a big impact on me. This, uh, there was a German logistics official for the SS Adolf Eichmann. And so he was essentially responsible for, uh, you know, moving people to and from the camps. Um, and so, you know, he was kind of just, uh, you know, a, in any other situation, right, he'd be a freight rail officer. Um, you know, pretty normal job, I guess, you know, <laughs> you know, if it, the cargo wasn't so, uh, extreme and, um, and, and so what's interesting about the situation is, you know, he ran away to Argentina and he was eventually like apprehended by the Mossad. And, uh, you know, I think this was in like the 1970s, you know, so like 30 years after world war two and, you know, they eventually hanged him in Jerusalem. And so there were a whole bunch of books, you know, kind of published about this issue, right? Because it's a pretty massive moral quandary because Adolf Eichmann said, you know, I did nothing. So I just moved people, you know, on trains, um, mm-hmm. right? I was stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. You know, I had to do this job, right? Or I would have been killed. You know, what was I to do? And, you know, what's tough, what, you know, what may, it really makes you face a tough question, right? If you put yourself in Adolf Eichmann's shoes, because let's say, you know, you worked for um, the U.S. freight rail, right? You're just a guy who, you know, even just sets the tracks, right? This is, there's a, philosoph- a classical philosophy problem, the trolley problem. But let's say you're the guy who just sets the tracks. You decide if the train goes right or if it goes left. If you're placed in a situation where essentially someone puts a gun to your head, and says, you need to make the train go left and kill all these people. You know, what are you to do? At the end of the day, you're the freight rail philosopher. And ask, or you're the freight rail manager, excuse me. Um, and, and so I think this <laughs> You're the freight rail philosopher, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But, you know, just thinking about the situation, like, it just it really makes you face this dilemma yourself. Like, you know, what would I do, mm-hmm. right? You know, how would I apply this to this situation? Hopefully, you know, it doesn't come down to that situation. You're able to make choices earlier that prevent this. But it really shows the importance also of, of making choices earlier and stopping this sort of banal evil is the concept. Basically, this like common evil where, you you know, you're just, you know, you're not killing someone. You're just turning a lever, right? You're a piece in the clock. And it just shows you the importance of stopping that kind of evil and helping people understand, like, you know, you're moving these pieces and you say, I'm not doing anything bad, but by moving those pieces, you're enabling something that's terrible. Um, and so that kind of just really changed the way I thought about the world. Cause you know, if you, when you ask yourself that question, well, if I was the person pulling the lever, you know, you really think deep and hard about yourself and you know who you are. Um, and you know, I don't know, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know what I would do. Um, but, you know, you got to hope that you would do the, the right thing in that case, right? Which is uh, take the bullet and, and save all those people, which is a tough thing, you know, to really think about, right? That's a, not a great situation. But I think, you know, what that's what Hannah Wren is kind of her impact on my life. And that's why I'm willing to, like, engage with people in what I think are sometimes stressful situations. Like, you know, I'm willing to talk with people in traffic because I understand I can do the good thing. By instead of reinforcing the stressful situation, if I'm just like, hey, man, I'm going to turn right or something like that, I yell that. I'll yell it to people from my car. Um, I'll yell it to people in my car from my bike and stuff like that. And it's just kind of, to me, that's just a way, a small way in which you can kind of stop this banal evil, which to me is traffic fatalities, which, you know, are caused by stress, um, you know, because, you know, I, I think that's definitely like a big thing in my life is making sure that people do that properly. And like, that's such a small, stupid hangup. But for me, it's like really important because like I've been hit by a car. I've almost been hit by cars in way worse times. Um, but you know, I saw to me, like one of my big, like pet peeves, I guess one of the big things I focus on is communicating with people in these traffic situations to kind of stop this banal evil, this common evil. No one's trying to do anything bad, but because they're cogs in the machine, terrible things happen. Right. And so I try and do my part to stop that. Um, I think that's just an easy thing a lot of people can do is communicating in in traffic as a pedestrian, as a biker, as a scooter rider, as a driver. Like that's such an easy thing that people can do and pay attention to a small habit that like saves lives. You know what I mean? Um, Because the time I did get hit by a taxi cab, it would have been way fucking worse if I didn't communicate with them first. They just kind of like sideswiped me. And then another time I actually hit a car because this car just like breaks like no other. Um, And, you know, that was kind of a situation, you know, similar thing. Like it was just a shit show. Like the whole situation, like people like ran in front of the car. So I didn't really blame them, but they were trying to blame me. And I was like, dude, like, you know, you need to chill out. But uh, (laughs) yeah, I think that's like, you know, Hannah Rents, like her philosophy was a big influence on me and trying to think in those terms. Um, you know, cause it's, you know, so a lot of these philosophers would say like, you know, it's important to, to try and do good. Like all that matters is the intention. And like, you know, what I've always said is that's bullshit because, you know, I intend a lot of shit, but I don't end up with it. And it's because I didn't work for it. And I didn't take that intention and turn it to a reality. And, and what people need to realize, I think is, is doing good in a lot of cases, you know, people I think should have a higher expectation of themselves and try and do the good thing. And sometimes that's really fucking hard, right? Sometimes that's taking the bullet from the guy because you don't pull the lever, right? Or trying Mm -hmm. to stop him from shooting you or something. Like maybe if you're a badass, you know, and and like maybe if you're on steroids, you could, uh, you know, hit the gun away or something (laughs) like that. Um, Yeah, man. I think a lot of what you said comes back to the conversation we just had as white guys engaging with this conversation around race because – a lot of times I've heard about a white person unintentionally being very insensitive or yeah. unintentionally doing something racist. And, you know, I've if probably just, done if it. just yeah. for sure, probably all I yeah. think it's, yeah. I think in, until we educate ourselves, it's kind of just unfortunately part of the deal. Yeah. And it's like, if intention counted for everything that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That there would be no learning. There would be no reckoning. There yeah. would be no improvements. Um, yeah. So awesome, man. That's definitely right, man. I was thinking the same thing. So, 
you know, I'm glad you thought of it because uh, I think, you know, people, tr- they say they try and do better. But, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of practice to do better. Um, so, you know, I guess that's a great takeaway for your, your audience is, you know, practice does make perfect with everything. Um, and I guess that includes uh, racial tension. Hundred percent. Okay, and we and we pivot to the three things game. Libby, I should know this. I'm sorry, I don't. I'm gonna guess. Is your birthday in October? September. Late September. September. Very late September, so almost October. Okay, word. Well, I'm up first, so I'll read a question, I'll answer it, then you'll have a second question for yourself. Okay. Okay. What are three things you have learned from taking risks? That's my question. Circles back to the the first thing we talked about. One thing I would say is that Risks are awesome. Totally right. I'm pro risk. I'm pro chances because it opens doors. It it creates great memories. Mm-hmm. Um, number two would be around calculate calculated risks. I've learned are are better than uh, just shooting from the hip. If mm-hmm. to use that analogy, because things go wrong. To also, you know, like adventures are awesome. Think before you act. Journeys. Yeah, think before you act. Exactly. That's number two. The third thing I've learned from taking risks, mm, trust my gut, I would say. Trust my gut. Mm-hmm. If something is risky but it feels right, you know, I've been wrong. I've, I've, I've made the wrong call, but I trusted my gut at the time. And that's, at the end of the day, all I can ever fall back on is my intuition. So that's what I would say around risk is that I rely on my intuition. I trust my intuition. And that's what I'm going to go for in those those uncertain moments. Mm-hmm. Those are good. Awesome. So All right, man. It, was, it was take risks because they, they pay out. It was make calculated, calculated risks. Yeah. And then what was the third one again? Lean on the intuition. Lean on intuition. Trust your gut. I like those three. Oh, yeah, man. All right. Here's your question. What are three things your last romantic partner taught you? Oh, <laughs> it's been a long time. There you go. Reach back into the memory. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Last, here. Here's here's a good philosophy trick. So last could also mean most current, right? So, right, you could, you know. Yeah, true. Exactly. So that's what I'm going to go with. Um, your last and your current, yeah. Yeah, so. Wow, what a pivot. That was impressive. Nicely done. <laughs> that's why you should study philosophy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the uh, and pay attention in English class because I didn't pay attention in English class, but I did pay attention in philosophy. And you know, if I could do that, imagine what if I did if I did both. Um, but three things that Sam taught me: I think the importance, you know, number one of kind of embracing my feelings. Like you know, that's definitely something that I've not always been comfortable with. You know, being comfortable expressing negative feelings. You know, that's something that I guess being more sensitive is if that's the right word. Um, is, is definitely something that I, you know, kind of have, have learned, right. You know, I'd bottle up those sorts of feelings. Um, you know, I think that's the first one. The second one is that it's okay to relax. Um, you know, I think like part of my personality or whatever is I always want to go, 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 go. And I definitely burn out and then you crash, right. Cause it, that's not sustainable. So it's definitely important to be willing to take breaks, you know, for your sanity, take like five, 10 minutes for yourself. You know, if you just need to kind of reset if you need to um you know re re calculate your risk um you know just take take short breaks if you need it take a longer break if you need it because it's important not to burn out um and i think that's something that she did you know in the past that's a failure that she had and she learned from um so it's something she's very conscious of now which i think is good because like recently like working out like i hurt my knee and like i definitely hurt my knee because i played back well i had pre-existing stuff going on but I played basketball for like four hours straight after I hadn't played for like two, three weeks, you know, right? Like it's, you know, just too much at mm-hmm, too much at mm-hmm. once. Um, and then let's see the third thing that Sam's told me being positive, definitely being positive. Oh, I think I that's that. something, that's something that we've been emphasizing recently. And I think that's from her, um, you know, making sure that you're finding the good in the situation is always a plus that you can do. And that's super easy. And uh, it's, you know, it's easy with Sam around a lot easier with Sam around. Beautiful, man. I love that. Awesome. Lee B. 
Well, thank you so much for getting on here and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom and you know it. modeling vulnerability for all the lads out there. Vulnerability is cool. <laughs> Dude, you got it. It's like, it's like, look, I was playing airsoft this weekend, man. And uh, here's, here's a simple fact that applies in airsoft and it, it applies in life. In order to shoot other people, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and get shot. And you know what? A lot of times getting shot isn't that bad. Take lots of small risks if it's not going to like hurt you that much. If it's someone rejecting you, like that's not going to hurt you that much. You know, so you got to put yourself out there. Why not? Why not? Life is short. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Lee B. Thank you, Tom. Have a great night, man. There it is, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And thank you to Lee for coming on the show. I think you spoke with a lot of compassion and empathy around a lot of topics which is great to see. Send the show along to a friend, somebody who you think will enjoy it. And we'll see you next Thursday on the Bro Nouveau podcast.